come on in to Margaret McSweeney's Kitchen for Kitchen Chat, where every week you'll meet chefs, cookbook authors, foodies, gourmets, and just plain people who love to eat. And along with laughter, chat, recipes, and stories about food, you'll sometimes also hear words of inspiration, love, and hope. As Margaret always says, Kitchen Chat is food for the senses and food for the soul. So grab a cup of coffee, put your feet up on a comfy chair, and get ready to spend a little time with Margaret and her friends. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kitchen Chat TV on the road. It is truly my delightful honor today to be here with the legendary Anne Willen, who is the founder of La Varenne in Paris. And it's just like hugs from heaven and, and a historic moment to be with you here in your home, Anne. Thank it's you. very good to have you here. Oh. Well, I am so excited to chat about Anne's new book called Secrets from La Varenne Kitchen, 50 Essential Recipes Every Cook Needs to Know. What was the inspiration behind this book? Well, it was one of those books that just wrote itself. Mm -hmm. Because when we opened La Varenne 40 years ago, 40 years ago, yes, we were handing out quantities of basic recipes to people. Yes. And things like stock and meringue and pie pastry and that you couldn't make a finished recipe without the basic ingredients. You can't make a pie without the dough. And so we put together a little book and here is a copy of it that was called Love Our End Basic Recipes. This is a goosebump moment, everyone, because this is the original book that was handed out at your cooking school, La Varenne. And I must we still do. Yes, you still hand this out. Yes, oh, that's we do. so special. So come here. Oh, and I have, yes, and it's so exciting because, Anne, you have influenced and trained some of today's top chefs. We have some wonderful students. Yes. We've, um, Quite a lot of writers, the editor of the Boston Globe, the food editor of the Boston Globe, for instance, Cheryl Julian, the founder, Amanda Hesse of Food 52. Uh, we have quite a lot of chefs, and there's a huge spread now of careers for young people and not so young people in food. Men and women, when I first started out, it was far more difficult for women. But now you, with food styling, um, recipe development, recipe testing, food photography, television, yes. everything that's developing very rapidly now on the Internet. Mm -hmm. So not only are more and more people, I think, interested in food and cooking and interesting eating um, and trying out ethnic possibilities, but many, many more jobs and interests and ways of pursuing things are developing too. And it's so exciting because we're part of, and you are one of the original members of the International Association of Culinary Professionals. And it's so exciting. And I'm going to provide a link uh, for you to look at perhaps joining it. They're great webinar series. But it, it's just always such a joy to see and hear from the different people you've influenced, including mm -hmm. Chicago's own Chef Gail Gand. Dear Gail, yeah. of course, she was a great <laughs> student um, and now author. Um, I think I'm right. She has a restaurant, but certainly wonderful, wonderful pastries yes. and a great and very distinguished, distinguished career. Yes. And I love to, and I, we're definitely going to talk about this wonderful book, but this is such a moment of history and to be able to share this with you, Anne, is just so meaningful to me. And I just would love for the listeners and viewers to hear about your friendship with Julia Child. Julia was a very good friend. Mm -hmm. There's a picture of her on the wall just around the corner. Oh. Oh, we first met Julia, of course, in just the right place. Uh, we were in the audience of, she was doing a television taping in Boston. 
And I know exactly when it was. It was the beginning of March. Um, and I was nine months pregnant with our daughter. So it has got to be, she is 43. So we can work out just when it was. Anyway, um, Julia always took quite an interest in Emma, who now lives in London. Of course, she has children of her own, who cooked one day for Julia when it was Julia's birthday on August. It's My mother was the 14th and Julia was the 15th. I'm nearly sure it's that way around. And so Emma was about 12. And she cooked roast duck and a salad from the garden. And then she did a Genoise cake. And the recipe would have come from here. Um, And filled it with ice cream and poured a hot chocolate sauce over the top. So Julia, I think, enjoyed it. (laughs) <laughs> what a delicious memory. And did she inspire your own culinary journey in any way? I think probably in many ways, Julia was a wonderful example to us all of try it. You can do it. If it goes wrong, fix it. Try it again. She had an amazing career in lots of different directions, obviously the television, but traveling and cooking and teaching all over the country and writing cookbooks. And she was also a lesson of a very successful marriage. Mm. Mm. Her husband, Paul, was very much behind everything she did. How special. And it was so much fun, too, listeners and viewers. I saw Anne and the Washington, D.C., first ever Julia Child Foundation yes. Gala. And that was lovely. Yes. And the first award was given to Jacques Pepin. Yes. And who is more deserving <laughs> and more of a, a wonderful example oh. of everything that Julia represented and still stands for? Yeah. And it was so special that Jacques Pepin actually designed or illustrated mm-hmm. the menu that Daniel Belude designed. That's right. That's right. Oh. Just lovely. It, yes, it was. And it was so special. I mean, Jacques has all kinds of different gifts. Yes. and But one of them, and we have a little picture on the wall I'll show you, um, is as an artist. And I have a little picture of Jacques oh. of three swimming fish just oh. waiting to be caught. <laughs> I love that. And we're going to continue in just a minute in the kitchen to see these wonderful paintings. But first of all, we must chat about your wonderful new book. And I'm so curious, Anne, about this sauce Robert. Can you tell us about uh, that? <laughs> I'll have to look up the ingredients. Sure, okay. sure. Um, it'll tell me. Which and it's so it. exciting. This was from like the 1500s. Yes, it is. Um, I say here, this was the oldest of all sauces dating from the Middle Ages. It's basically brown gravy, Mm -hmm. but picked up in a really rather modern style, actually. Uh, A bit of white wine, white wine vinegar. So vinegar, I mean, just that kind of tartness, that slightly fermented taste. And we have a vinegar, a great big pot of homemade vinegar kind of fermenting away in the back. And we'll we get a picture. Yes. yes, we'll get a picture of that too. Um, and the sauce also has mustard. Mm. So it's good with lots of things. Mm. And I say here, particularly with pork. With pork. Mm-hmm. So sauce Robert with pork. That's that- it. <laughs> and then the other is, um, vegetable, uh, sauce. And can you tell us a bit about that? Dear, bechamel was much later. Sauce Robert 
oh, wouldn't have been thickened with flour. It wasn't till the 18th century that they started making the classic butter, melted butter, flour whisked in, and then very often milk, which is bechamel, um, whisked in to make white sauce. And I was amused. I've recently been in Texas, and I said, of course, this is just plain old white sauce. And everybody looked sort of slightly <laughs> vague. And then someone said, oh, it's very like cream gravy. And everybody <laughs> said, yes, yes. And bechamel is the French name for white sauce. Oh. And white sauce, of course, is the foundation of all kinds of other sauces. I mean, cream sauce and Mornay sauce with cheese and, or raw sauce with tomato. Oh. So that's what this little book is, this little book yes. is all about. And this is very special. And I'm going to choose a sauce to make in my kitchen from okay. your cookbook and feature it. And, what I think I might do is hollandaise, because as you know, I do kitchen chat to honor my father, and I have memories of him making hollandaise sauce in the kitchen. That's just lovely. I mean, weren't you lucky to have a father who made hollandaise sauce? Yes. Goodness, because it's it can go wrong, hollandaise oh. sauce. <laughs> oh, no, and this is going to be on camera when I make it, but no, no. <laughs> we'll wish for the best. Well... <laughs> It's very good to make a mistake on camera because then you have to um, put it right. Yes, you're absolutely right. I have a little Julia story about that. Yes. Julia was teaching at the Greenbrier in West Virginia, so quite big audience, probably about 70 people, and I was sitting at the back just listening, and she couldn't get the Hollandaise sauce to thicken. And she said, um, she said, come up and make it. Do what it ought to do. <laughs> and so I did. I love that memory. So she called you out of the audience to, to thicken that. Oh, this is just going to be such a treasure in my kitchen, Anne. And listeners, viewers, I'm going to provide a link for you, too, to add this to your kitchen and your cookbook repertoire. So thank you so much. And shall we journey into your kitchen. That's the right place to be. A oh. tour of Anne Willen's kitchen. And the first stop is this beautiful painting. Tell us about it. Well, this is a picture, of course, of Julia. Yes. Um, here I am. We're in a, my kitchen in France. Oh. And this was a wonderful chef we had at La Varenne when the cooking school was in France, who had two stars in his day. He's cooking a bit of pork, but his great specialty was fish. And you can see the little line of copper pots. Yes. This is taken from a photograph um, and very kindly painted by a former staff member of ours. And the same pots are hanging, or many of them, in the kitchen still right here. Yes, and let's go have a look at the beautiful copper pot collection. Mm -hmm. Here we are in Anne's kitchen with the incredible copper pots and pans collection. Tell us the history of this. Well, I kept the best of these from France and the school, and so I had a nice choice. Um, this, and you want copper because copper conducts the heat much the best, very evenly, very rapidly. And so it's nice, you want nice heavy copper. Um, and it's very good to cook in. It needs to be lined with something. Okay. Because, of course, if you leave any or cook any kind of acid in copper, it is very poisonous. And they, yes, oh. and they warn about it in medieval recipes. Yes. <laughs> I yes, never yes. Knew that. Don't leave food in the iron pot, they say. Oh. So that's lined with stainless steel, which actually isn't as good as tin, which is what this one's lined with. That's the saucepan. Um, that is Farlandez, which we were talking about. Yes. This is a jam pot, 
that I got, um, that you find them in the French supermarkets. And they're not expensive, and it's solid copper. They're not lined, so you, when you put the fruit and the sugar in it... Yes. Um, sorry, oh, I should have no, gone the other no, way. No, that's fine. I'll just do this. <laughs> so that when you put the fruit and the sugar in it, yes. uh, you have to cook them, mm -hmm. pop the jam, and then move on. Because if you leave it there, it'll create, in fact, Copper oxide, which is a very nasty poison. This yeah. is good to know for the whole chef. Yes. Now, what is yes. your favorite jam to make? Oh, I like making all sorts of different things. I mean, we do have a little fig tree in the garden. Oh. So I made fig, black figgy jam with red wine one year. Peaches. Oh, I made peach and ginger jam. That's good. Wow. So all sorts of different mixtures I like to experiment. I can only imagine all of the delicious meals that have been prepared in your pots and pans in this mm -hmm. kitchen. This well, such a joy. that one, is, I've had it for, since I started cooking in France in the early 1960s. Wow. Um... Some that will be over, I think. Yeah. I would have got that second hand, and most of the others have oh. lived a good life already and will keep going for the rest of mine. Yeah, this is such a special collection. Thank you for sharing your copper pots and pans with us and also the tips about it, too. Okay. And we will avoid poisoning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now we'll go see Jacques Pepin's painting. So now we're here in the butler's pantry in your kitchen, and just so many wonderful things stand out. Uh, first of all, your IACP Cookbook Award, congratulations, and then the Cordon Bleu. The, That's oh. my grand diploma, dates from the early 60s. Oh, yes. how special. And can you share with us about this very oh, special well, painting? Um, oh, the painting yes. is really nice, isn't it? Yes. This is by Jacques Pépin, and each of the fish have just little expressions on their faces, <laughs> and the front one looking really good. <laughs> and what dish do you think they're about to be made into? Oh, we are best, don't you think? <laughs> yes. They look to yes. me like we are best fish, because they'll be very bony. <laughs> okay. So. I mean, yeah, that's not a take off the filet sort of fish. Right. No. Oh, how special. And when did he paint this for you? Well, I got it about four years ago, probably. Oh. So when he painted it, I don't know. There's not a date yes. on it. But there's a little signature. There we are. Oh. Um, it just... Yes, looks like two thousand. Might be. Yes, it does, yes. doesn't it? Yes, yes. How I think so. Special to have that, and we'll yes. make sure that we put a link to Jacques Pepin's art as well. So yes, yes. because um, I bought it, and he was selling this and other ones for, for charity. Oh. So that would be good. You never know; there might be a few more out there. Yes, and I love that he gives mm. back to charity yes, with that. Exactly, and I love the juxtaposition of the fish. Next to your vinegar oh, pot, can you share you with us? Put all the fish in the vinegar. <laughs> yes, you probably could. It shouldn't have an apple on the top because it's not <laughs> cider vinegar. It's red wine vinegar, oh. and it needs air. Okay. So we have um, cheesecloth on the top. Wow. And then inside, can you do come and have a look this? inside. Yes. Look at this homemade red wine vinegar in Anne Willen's kitchen. Now, what I want you to see yes, is the mother. Okay. Because there's a kind of curious... Goodness, the warm weather is making it develop very rapidly. Yes. A curious kind of membrane. Wow. Um, and then, just so you can see it, and then in there is vinegar... 
Yes, and hopefully I do that. Yes, yeah. there we go. You take it out of the bottom. Yes. It's a brewery pot, of course. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. And here in your kitchen, so you make this red wine vinegar, and what are some things you use it in? Well, we use it basically um, for salad, salad oh. dressing. Um, it's not really good for pickling because the acid content isn't all that high. Yes. You probably need white vinegar or something with a guaranteed acid percentage. Okay. But apart from that, it's wonderful for flavoring. Want and to put your finger in and taste it? Oh, shall I have a little taste? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Mm. This is the good. best red wine vinegar I've ever mm. had. It's much better than that wretched bottle stuff. <laughs> Yeah. You should, oh, this is just amazing. Okay. Well, all you do is keep adding red wine. Leftover or a whole bottle if you really need it. Leftover red wine. So, but you do need a mother. And where do you find a mother? If someone you wants ask to... a friend. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just... And actually, you can buy it on the oh, internet. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But um, I was given this by Suzanne Dunaway who is an author and baker who lived oh. around the corner. And it's crossed the Atlantic twice. Oh. <laughs> this so, is an international... <laughs> exactly. So goodness knows what enzymes oh, yes. and all the rest of it aren't in it. How special. I'll this... give you a bottle to take home if you'd like one. That would be so amazing. Sure. Thank you. Oh, this is yeah. just so special to be in your kitchen, Anne, and to be with you and any... Three tips you could give to the listeners and viewers from your lifelong experience in the culinary world, besides, of course, the cookbooks, which we will provide. But are there any three easy tips for the home chef to remember? Well, I don't know about tips, but you need good knives. Okay. You don't need lots of them. I've got a nice lineup there, but three knives. You need a chef's knife. Okay. Something that feels right in your hand. So test them before yes. you... You only want one. Okay. And then you need a middling size knife. In France it's called a fish knife. Mm. With a nice slender blade that bends slightly when you press it on the, the, okay. the board. And then you need a little vegetable knife. And with those three you can do anything. It's all about the knives then. Okay. Yes, and the, and the copper is. pots too. You need a whisk. <laughs> okay. And after that, you can do just about anything. Especially with your cookbooks in hand mm -hmm. and the La Varenne online. You have online downloads available too for La Varenne. Uh, cookbook. So we'll make sure we make this all accessible to you, dear listeners and viewers. But Meemaw, thank you so much for this incredible opportunity to be here in your kitchen, Ian. It's great to talk to you. Oh, thank you so much. And always remember, dear listeners and viewers, to take a moment and savor the day. Thanks for joining Margaret for Kitchen Chat today. Margaret would be so excited for you to drop by and visit with her at kitchenchat.info, where you'll enjoy podcasts, blogs, recipes, tips from chefs, and even great giveaways. She invites you to share your recipes and kitchen stories, too. As Margaret always says, savor the day.